Well, the gospel brings many benefits. We think about forgiveness, about victory, about redemption, and all kinds of other benefits. But the greatest benefit of the gospel is, of course, God himself. The cross removes the barrier that separates sinners from God, and the cross restores the relationship broken by, with our Creator by our sin. This is the meaning of the atonement, the cross whose very shape points to its purpose, the vertical beam symbolizing our reconciliation with God, and of course the horizontal beam that shows how Christ's sacrifice reconciles us with one another. You'll learn this and more from Jeremy Treat in his new book, The Atonement, an Introduction, part of the Short Studies and Systematic Theology series for Crossway. Well, Treat lives in Los Angeles, California, where he is the pastor for preaching and vision at Reality LA, a church with 115 different nations represented. He earned his PhD from Wheaton College and serves as an adjunct professor of theology at Biola University and as a fellow Uh, together with me at the Keller Center for Cultural Apologetics at the Gospel Coalition. And now we're talking here at Beeson Divinity School, where he's just been delivering our Conger lectures in preaching, and which have really been been delightful. Uh, You're going to find this book by Jeremy both moving and helpful, and I especially love the way he shows the atonement as upending the expectations of the world. Here's a quote that gives you a flavor for it. Jeremy writes, Herein lies the paradox of the gospel. The self-giving love of God transformed an instrument of death into an instrument of life. The cross is the great reversal where exaltation comes through humiliation. Glory is revealed in shame. Victory is accomplished through surrender. And the triumph of the kingdom comes through the suffering of the servant. End quote. And now... Jeremy joins me on Gospel Bound to discuss, I know, one of his favorite themes, the kingdom and cross, as well as many others. Jeremy, thanks for being here. It's great. Right together. Thanks for having me. In, in person. Birmingham, Alabama. In Birmingham, Alabama. My first time. <laughs> but hopefully not the last. No. We'll see how the podcast goes. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, get you, we'll get you back. Last thing before you head Well, you're right that the cross is the crowning achievement of Christ's kingdom mission. But you've heard the same thing I've heard, all kinds of debates about whether Christ came to die on the cross yeah. or whether he came to inaugurate the kingdom. All right, Jeremy, why don't you just answer that little question for us? <laughs> Which one is it? Yeah. Well, I mean, this is a question I wrestled with a lot because in my experience, you have one crowd that's all about the cross and another crowd that's all about the kingdom, and it's usually one to the exclusion of the other. And when I look to scripture, I see that you can't understand the kingdom apart from the cross, and you can't understand the cross apart from the kingdom. And it's Christ himself who holds those together. He is the king who goes to the cross in establishing his kingdom and ransoming us into it. So I think as you see those things come together, I mean, it's just at the heart of the biblical story. It's weaved in all throughout it. And then, of course, it culminates at the cross where you see Christ being enthroned as king. I mean, at one level— from a perspective, from a worldly perspective, it's a man being executed, he's losing, it's shame, and yet through the lens of faith, it's power, it's wisdom, it's victory. The kingdom of God is coming through the crucifixion of Christ. Another thing you write that, uh, quote, Christ brings the kingdom in a way that subverts the world's expectations mm-hmm. and yet fulfills humanity's deepest desires. In this kingdom, the throne is a cross, and the king reigns with mercy and grace. One of the things I love about this book is that you're writing it as a local church pastor. What does that subversion look like in the context of ministry of a local church? I mean, I I think the, the paradox of the cross is the foundation for this mustard seed principle that you see throughout scripture. It's, it's that the mustard seed's not impressive, and yet it grows to be the biggest plant, right, where the birds can come and take shade in it. It's the, the meek shall inherit the earth. It's the, compass- or it's, the, it's the outcasts who are brought in. I mean, you're constantly seeing this paradoxical community. I mean, that's what the Beatitudes give us a vision of. But that's just not like a good idea. Like, let's just flip things around. No, it's, it's the cross that flips the values of the world on its head, 
and says, no, the meek inherit the earth. The weak are actually strong. Uh, the outcasts are brought in. So it's a beautiful vision of community. Again, like I said in the book, that it's it's different than people expect, but it it's everything that they hope for. Do you think it's hard to understand that dynamic of subversion in part because the Christian revolution has been so successful? Because in yeah. some level, I think a lot of people hear that and they say, right, we should right. honor even the weak. We should care for one another. Is there something lost that sort of the, the radical nature of the cross? Yeah, 100%. I mean, to think pe- most secular people today who would say, yeah, it's obvious. Like everyone believes you should have compassion for the weak. It, like you'd want to respond with saying, well, the Romans didn't. <laughs> like they they would just kill people who were weak. They would dismiss people who held them back from whatever they were trying to achieve. So in some ways we have to show people that they are, they're experiencing a reality that's built on foundational Christian truths and they're drawing from that. Um, and, you know, there's people who have done this, of course, Tom Holland, his book Dominion has been so important, but Andrew Wilson, Glenn Scrivener, I mean, they've done a great job of helping people see how much even our secular society has drawn from biblical ideas. And this this in particular, I mean, this idea of, yeah, caring for the weak and the equality of all people, these these were not, those are, those are ideas that not only other people didn't believe, they believed the opposite. Of it, they built society around the fact that people are not um, equal, and that you should not care for people who are hurting. You should discard of them. Well, not only that was the exact situation that Jesus himself was in. Yeah, they they did not put him to the cross. I mean, they were threatened at some level by him, but they were able to do so yeah. because he was not in power mm-hmm. because he was weak. He was not part of the religious establishment or yep. the political establishment. Yeah. There. Well, you can see the way people responded to him, right? When he goes and cares for the outcasts, they're not saying, wow, what a loving guy, <laughs> right? They're like, the Pharisees are saying, what are you doing hanging out with those people? And now we need to kill you. Yeah. And his disciples are saying, why are you talking to that woman, the Samaritan woman, right? Yeah. So people were shocked by what he did. They didn't see it as a good thing. Um, now we can look back on that and see it, but it's ultimately because of the influence of Christ. What is the relationship between substitution and other so-called theories of atonement? Yeah, I mean, you got, we got to be careful with our language here because you get these different theories that people make of the atonement. You have, you know, penal substitution, Christus Victor, moral example, all these other ones. I don't. Th- I actually one of the things I say in the book is I think the theory approach is off. It's, it's not even a good way of starting the conversation. Is it because it just makes it feel like you can just pick and choose which theory you prefer or which one resonates with you? Well, the, re- the reason that this came about was nobody used theory language for atonement until the mid-1800s. Okay. And I mean, before that, nobody's saying there's this theory and it's and nothing else is true outside of it. And you have to choose these exclusive idea, mutually exclusive ideas. What you have happening in the 1800s in the development of the universities in in light of the Enlightenment, um, you have religion departments and Christians trying to fit in in university systems and borrowing language from other fields, and they start talking about theories of atonement. And then and then what happens over time is you have these um, pendulum swinging debates of Jesus died to satisfy the wrath of God. No, he didn't. He died to defeat the devil. And then it ends up being this either or where scripture presents a both and. So that's where like the theory approach in general, I just don't even think is helpful. It invites us to choose between biblical truths where we should be embracing the tension of those truths. So what I what I prefer to do is talk about dimensions of the atonement. You have victory, you have satisfaction, you have all the adoption, healing. And then to be able to say substitution is not just another dimension of what Christ accomplished. It's at the center that gives meaning. It's the how of of all that he accomplishes in in all of those various dimensions. So substitution isn't just another um, aspect. It's, It's core, it's heart. And I mean, I use heart not just in like, it's most important. 
but thinking about how heart works, it pumps blood into the body. It's it's connecting everything and giving meaning to it. Yeah, one of the things that Tim Keller would often say is that all love at some level is substitutionary. Mm-hmm. You know, that that really that's not just an aspect, but it's an essential yeah. aspect of of love in a number of different ways. Um why is God's triune nature essential for understanding substitutionary atonement? Yeah, this is so important because if we don't have a good doctrine of the Trinity going into the atonement, then we're going to go into all kinds of errors that Christians have slipped into where you you essentially end up pitting Jesus against the Father. And so I think about the the classic railroad tracks illustration, which like my generation, if you grew up in like evangelicalism, you heard it that, you know, the father's the, the railroad conductor and the son's playing in the tracks. Um, and he looks down and this train's coming. So he has to make the decision, you know, do I, do I shift the gears and sacrifice my son to save all the people? Or do I let the train go off the tracks and save my son? And so he sacrifices his son to save the people. The problem with that um, illustration, as much as it communicates the idea of sacrifice is that the son in that illustration is blindsided. He doesn't know what's happening. All of a sudden he's just crushed by train tracks. He didn't, he's not voluntarily submitting himself to that. And the father's doing what he's doing, not necessarily out of love, but more of a utilitarian principle of I'm going to save the many instead of the one. So you have illustrations like that that lead people to this idea of it's the father against the son and the father has to kill the son to save the many. And again, there's elements of truth in that, but you put it in the wrong story. Whereas in scripture, we see Jesus and the father are one and of one purpose. And Jesus isn't blindsided. He's voluntarily submitting himself out of love to save people. And so, and yes, the the father is angry towards sin, but so is the son. And the son is loving, but so is the father. So we really need to see the atonement as the apex of a, of the Trinitarian mission of God. Let me toss out a few specific examples and you can address these. Do you have a problem with us singing that the father turned his face away? I don't, but I think you need good like theology around that. So I, I like the way that Fred Sanders talked about this. He said, if, if you have a good understanding of who God is and sin and, and the doctrine of the Trinity, like you can sing that song in a sense that understands what that means. Of uh, Even Jesus crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Right. Like there's something there. Like we need to understand that in light of Psalm 22. We need to understand it in light of the end of Psalm 22 and the relation of the Father and the Son. But no, I can definitely sing that wholeheartedly. Yeah, so I was going to then toss out a few other terms. Forsaken is one of them. It yeah. seems well, that's pretty close to the biblical text there Mm -hmm. in Psalm 22 that Jesus is invoking. Um, What are some other language that we could use or should not use? I mean, abandon or divided or how would you recommend us? This is especially for those of us who are preaching. Yeah. Um, This is where a lot of this comes out. And there's a lot of rhetorical um, flourish that you can inject Mm -hmm. into this situation when you're preaching a Good Friday sermon or a general yeah. Um, this message about the, the extent to which Jesus suffered for our for our sake yeah. and because of us mm-hmm. bearing our sins. So just give us a little bit more recommendation of things maybe we could say or, or maybe that we should avoid saying. I, I think the we want to avoid language of like a broken trinity. Yeah. This idea that like for three days, you know, God wasn't God. Um where the father and the son were against each other for three days for us. I I think anything like that, like we need to avoid that type of language. Um, I also just, the way I try and preach of it is I think of second Corinthians five, God in Christ is reconciling the world to himself. That's good. So even with language of forsakenness or like any of that, I just try and frame it within that sense of Christ took on our forsakenness, but is it's God in Christ doing that? Um, yeah, I mean, John Stott talks about the self substitution of God in Christ, and we constantly need that language to remember that when we're talking about Jesus, that He's the Son who's empowered by the Spirit and sent by the Father, um, that gives us a, that broader framework that's necessary. 
Another thing I, I love about this book is that you have a a preacher's ability to to share and communicate memorable lines, um, even while you're doing some you know serious theology here. You, your book is again just full of these lines. I've I've shared a number of them already with with others, but one of them is you say the cross is the apex of the incarnate Christ's mission. Very clear and compelling. But I'm wondering why wouldn't the apex of his mission be his teaching? Or why wouldn't the apex of his mission be his example yeah. of loving your enemy? Yeah. Well, let me say this. I, I would never want to set those things up against each other as if it's like, because the cross matters, his teaching doesn't matter. Okay. Or like when you get into like, what's more important, the death or resurrection of Jesus? So like, it's not a helpful way of approaching it. That's not what you're doing because you're yeah. asking what's the apex. Right. Um, I'm just using your word. Though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But <laughs> but I want to be I want to be clear on that of of talking about the centrality of the cross, or it is the apex of the story. It doesn't minimize the other aspects of his ministry. I think it actually puts them in perspective. And the cross means nothing apart from the life of Christ and the resurrection of Christ. Yeah. And so I think that um the reason I would lean towards the centrality of the cross, I mean, there's multiple things with this. One is when you're looking at the Gospels, I mean, the Gospel of Mark spends half of the Gospel on the last week of his life, right? So there's a sense of this is the part of the movie where you slow down and zoom in and it, everything's leading up to that. So I think the way that the Gospels present it, I think that the way that the rest of the New Testament of not just Paul, and of course, Paul's emphasizing the resurrection too, but I think the cross and resurrection are doing different things. Um, but the way Paul is doing that, for Paul to be able to say, we preach Christ and him crucified, um, like he's encapsulating everything in that phrase. But from that to the book of Hebrews, I just think there's an emphasis on the cross and the that being a sin, it has the explanatory power of dealing with sin. And that theologically, I think, is really important. So you're sitting in a small group or a Sunday school. You're not the one teaching. Somebody else is teaching in your church, and they say, Jesus came to die. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like you need to correct that at all or add context <laughs> to that? Or do you say, no, absolutely, that's exactly right? Or, or do you have to say, well, he also came to fulfill the, you know, whatever you want to say, the mission of God, yeah. the people of Israel. I mean, how do you... What do you what do you do in that moment? Yeah, I mean, I think it depends on the context. And if I feel like they're saying it in a way to minimize other things, if if someone's talking about the incarnation, they're like, well, 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 Jesus came to die, then it's like, well, hold on. Like, um Like as if the incarnation were only a way to get him a physical body that he could sacrifice. Right. But it's like, but if they're just making that point in general, I, I have no problem with that. I think it's true. That's what Athanasius argued in his book called On the Incarnation that Jesus came to die and he needed to take on a human body and able to do that. So I, um, yeah, I don't, I don't have any problem with that as long as it's not used as a way of minimizing or dismissing the other aspects. Of well, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, you, you do such a good job of bringing these things together, of reconciling these things, but I'm not sure how many people watching or listening always know the way these are often pitted against right. each other. The way it's, no, we're we're a red letter church where right. we focus on the things Jesus said and we follow mm -hmm. that versus all those black letter churches that focus on his death mm -hmm. or things like that. Or we're, we're Jesus Christians, we're not Pauline right. Christians or things like that. So, and a lot of that happens not just at an academic level, but a very popular mm -hmm. level. So some people watching and listening, they may be familiar with that, but but I think that's one reason your book is so helpful is because it it shows that all these things cohere mm -hmm. in God's redemptive plan, yeah. um, and they shouldn't be pitted against each other, even as we might describe some things as an apex without saying that nothing else right. matters. Um, the cross is shameful humiliation. It's an important theme in your book. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that theme of shameful humiliation is is hard for some of us, at least, to see and understand in the West? Yeah, well, I think, I mean, the the West is a is a context that's more guilt driven than shame driven. Every society has both of those. Yeah. It's, it's just a part of basic anthropology. But 
we live in an individualistic um, society that leans more towards guilt. And the Bible was written in a very communal society that's an honor and shame oriented. So we just miss it. We, we, we often don't see it. We read, you know, we read the Bible and we assume it's, it's saying something to the individual where it's often written to the community. Uh, we miss, and we miss really obvious things about shame because it doesn't necessarily use the word shame. So an example of this is the Gospels present Christ's death on the cross as bearing our shame. I mean, that is one of the, if not the predominant theme in what Jesus is accomplishing on the cross. But Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John don't say Jesus is bearing our shame, but it's so obvious in the way that they tell the story. I mean, think about this. Like, in our context, like, if you grow up in the church, what do you hear about the cross? The physical pain of Jesus, right? Like, I grew up, I watched The Passion of the Christ. I heard I heard preachers constantly talking about how it must have felt for his, the, his raw skin to be scraping against the cross and the nails going through the arteries. Check this out. The Gospels never mention the physical pain of the cross. They don't talk about it at all. Like it's not even on the radar. Now that doesn't minimize it. Of course, the the physical pain of the cross was real, but all of the emphasis in the gospels is on the shame, the public shame of the cross. Jesus is stripped naked. He's mocked by those who are passing by. Uh, They're saying, why don't you come down if you're a savior? He's crown of thorns, thorns, the sign. It's all mockery. Yeah, the sign that says king of the Jews. They're making fun of him. They're trying to publicly humiliate The him. cross itself was I mean, designed for shame. Yes. I mean, if they wanted to just get rid of Jesus, they could have beheaded him. They could have burned him at the stake quickly. There's other ways that to inflict physical pain yeah. as well. That was a very physical, physically painful thing, but it didn't have to be public. Yep. They could have tortured him for a lot longer in different right. ways. And crucifixion is, it's it's literally a slow tortuous death and it's naked yeah all sorts so of so they're saying through narrative that jesus is bearing our shame and and that doesn't that doesn't um doesn't create a false dichotomy with shame and guilt he's clearly bearing our guilt as well and the and the epistles tease that out a lot but they also build uh, tease out shame in ways that we just miss i mean i think of like Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Like that's like the go-to verse when you talk about sin. That's an honor and shame type of framework. Like honor and shame, the glory of God is honor. We've fallen short of that. We're in shame. So there's just a lot about shame that we miss because we don't think that way in our society. When Peter denied Jesus three times, was he ashamed or guilty? Well, I would say both. Um, I'm, I'm, and he was clearly ashamed to be associated right, with Jesus. Right. Um, and, and I think the emphasis there on the servant girl mm-hmm. seems to contrast that if he's, he's ashamed to be associated with Jesus, his accent mm-hmm. marks him out. Mm-hmm. It's a servant girl that he's denying yeah. himself to, but then maybe perhaps afterward he feels guilty yeah. because of what he's done to his friend. Sure. And probably felt ashamed too. And even when yeah. Jesus is coming to him of like yeah. the language of like, I'm not worthy is like, that's shame, that's shame type of language. Right. So that's where I would say we need to read a story like that and be able to say, how are guilt and shame both at work in that? Yeah. That's why that we in the West can learn a lot from honor shame societies. Like the the Asian Americans in my church have helped me learn a lot about honor and shame, but societies in uh, you know honor and shame societies can learn from the West about guilt as well because that's a really important biblical theme. So we need each other to have a fuller understanding of the cross. I opened with your quote about the paradox of the gospel. You also write this: the the cross is the ultimate exhibit of God's judgment being poured out on sin. The cross is also the definitive showcase of God's mercy. For on it, Christ bore the judgment of sinners so that they may be saved. Um, I think we could probably go back to Romans 3 mm-hmm. uh, to be able to to identify this as well. But I'm wondering, Jeremy, what, is this, what does this mean to you personally? Mm-hmm. And what, is it, what does it do to your heart? Man, it's everything for me. I mean, I, 
like I grew up in the church. And so for me to become a Christian, I had to learn that I wasn't a Christian. <laughs> you know, like I, I thought I, I learned how to play the game of Christianity and I'm good at performing and learning new things. And I learned how to like say the right things and do the right things when I was at church. And then when I was at school, be a totally different person. Hmm. And I'll never forget when God first exposed my sin to me. It's like I saw my self-righteousness and how prideful I was. And so it was like, I recognized my sin and the judgment that I deserve because of that. I was like, I'm terrible. Like I've been using God to make myself look good religiously. Like that's terrible. But then it's like the minute I understood that sin, I had this overwhelming flood of God's grace and mercy in recognizing that in my life. So I think about even my own conversion of how that, like the mercy and justice of God came together in my heart to make me new. But then I think about today, I think what I experienced in that moment, uh, people in our society are longing to figure out how do mercy and justice fit together? Right? How can love and holiness come together? That's why I think the cross is such a great apologetic because it's the, it's the fullness of mercy and justice coming together in a person who's giving himself in love. It's beautiful. Like Hollywood can't write a story that good. <laughs> Not even Netflix next door, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Jeremy talked in his lectures here at, at Beeson about how Netflix is next to their church and how he'll often tell his congregation that Netflix doesn't have anything. Yeah, we may us. be next to Netflix, but we've got the best story in town. We've got the best story in town. <laughs> it's great for Los Angeles. Um, what does the atonement then do for our pursuit of justice here and now? I, I do think this is one of the critiques. In fact, I remember one prominent uh, Twitter voice saying in 2016 that she blamed penal substitutionary atonement for Donald Trump. <laughs> it's like, it's because it's so individual and focused on guilt and otherworldly that, you know, that's penal substitutionary atonement. And that's why we ended up with, with President Trump. I remember that vividly. I remember, wow, that was, that was quite a leap. But, um, <laughs> But I was wondering, how, how does this teaching on the atonement work out in your church in Hollywood? Here's an example, one thing I, I like what you wrote. You said, Jesus breaks the cycle of injustice by responding to the greatest injustice of the world with love. He defeats hate through mercy. You've, you've just been looking at this. Mm -hmm. Christ dies not to reverse the positions of the oppressed and the oppressor, but rather to redeem both and make them family by grace. Yeah. So when you're preaching atonement, substitution in your church, not just substitution, but that, you know, that aspect of it, how does that play out in the pursuit of justice? Yeah, I mean, I think about like, I mean, here we are in Birmingham, Alabama. I think yeah. about Martin Luther King Jr. talking about how hate begets hate yeah. and violence begets violence. And that's what that's what like a pursuit of justice often looks like in our society today. Like when our society champions justice it's often driven by hate or by vengeance. Yeah. Like take down the other side or we're going to get them back or they've had their time. Reversing, like you said, the oppressor-oppressed yes. dynamic. And yeah. and so all that does is it creates this never-ending cycle of, okay, once you're the you're in power then, then whoever you're over it needs to take you down. So Jesus undoes all of that, not by meeting hate with hate, but by meeting it with love. And so I think that's, it's a model for Christians in seeking justice today. And this is, I mean, Micah 6, 8 is do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with our God. So we seek justice, but we do so with a posture of love. And I just think that the cross, like what's interesting to me, Colin, is that when I was like growing up, justice was something that conservative Christians love to talk about. Yeah. And, Law and order. And, yeah, and liberals yeah, didn't, right? right? Yeah. And and you were almost kind of ashamed to talk about it. And like, like, okay, I know it, like God's just, but like, let me explain. It's okay. <laughs> and now like justice is this great thing, but but we want to talk about justice in terms of like what it looks like for what we do, but we don't want to talk about it with God. Well, I think in scripture, God is a God of justice, but he executes his justice through his people who are called to be a people of justice. Now, there's certain aspects of that, obviously, we leave to the Lord. Vengeance is mine, declares the Lord. Yeah. But, man, I think, like, if I'm preaching 
justice and the cross. And then we're saying, okay, we believe in justice, but not in the sense of like, we're all on the right side of history and we're righteous and we've got it figured out and we got to convince everyone else. But no, we're not just, we've fallen short, but God's making us new and drawing us into his mission, which is one of mercy and justice. Well, whether it's left or right, the appropriation of justice apart from the cross often is a cover for self-righteousness. Yeah. Um, and I think that's part of what we've seen is that regardless of which political side wants to co-opt it, yeah. it's often a means of being able to identify myself on the side that wouldn't need substitution. Yeah, totally. Because we're right because the other group is effectively that's wrong. Good. I should have put that in the book. <laughs> well, uh, always a chance in the future. <laughs> Uh, there's a noteworthy observation. You say, again, another one of these pithy lines, a true test of theology is whether it helps the church to suffer well. I'm going to ask this question in a little bit of a counterintuitive fashion. How do you see this play out in unbiblical teaching about the atonement that does not help us to suffer well? Yeah, so like a like an over-realized eschatology. Prosperity. That, yeah, or the prosperity theologies. gospel that says... Here. It says, because of what Christ has accomplished, uh, you have the fullness of healing, yeah. which tells you, which tells tells you that then if you don't experience, if you're sick and you don't experience healing, the problem's with you. It's not with Christ because He already accomplished your healing, and so you must not have enough faith, or God must be punishing you, and so that sets people up for failure of just being disappointed with God uh, for not keeping promises He never made when. Yes, we experience healing. Our, by his stripes, we are healed. But we're not promised the fullness of that until the return of Christ. And yet in, in the middle, I think we will experience healing, but we will also experience God's power made perfect through our weakness. And so by his stripes, we're healed. And yet we're filling up what's lacking in the affliction of Christ. Uh, a, a last question here that just... Um... Something that stuck out, stood out as I was reading your book, again, Jeremy Treats, my guest here, talking about the atonement and introduction. It's part of the Short Studies in Systematic Theology series for Crossway. I wondered how your theological writing uh, relates to your pastoral ministry. You write that this is what theology is about, faith-seeking understanding in service of faithful living. Uh, you're borrowing from... Augustine on that, facing yeah. understanding, right, yeah. exactly, and sort of adding your twist on there as well. But I don't always see this connection to faithful living and theological writing. Mm -hmm. What do you attribute that to? Is that because you're writing this theology as a pastor? You're you're thinking about how do, how do I apply this? Or Because again, it just, I think that's one of the challenges for me is that those two worlds don't always connect. Yeah. The practical ministry world, the theological world, of course, I care about this a lot, teaching in a seminary here yeah. where we're training students where ultimately this is what we want to see, but it doesn't always work that way. Yeah, I mean, I, I have a deep conviction that theology is for life, that theology is meant to equip disciples to love God with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so that shapes everything that I do. It shapes my preaching. It shapes the way that I teach in the classroom. Um, and I think that's the, I think that's, that's what scripture gives us. That's what the apostle Paul was doing in the book of Romans. Um, but I think what's happened is this divide has happened over years and you can get into the development of the university system and the enlightenment, dividing things and disciplines and kind of relegating theology to ivory tower and church being for, you know, just caring for people without getting into the, the deep weeds. So you've, you've got this divide, but um, yeah, I, I, I want to try and overcome that and be able to say we need rich, deep theology, but we need to be able to connect it to what people are doing on Monday at work or Tuesday when they're going out with their friends um, or Wednesday when they're watching the news. Or Thursday when they're serving the homeless. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, Jeremy, this is one of my favorite theology books that I've read in the last year. I think it works really well in a student context. I think I would also recommend it in for elders to read through if they just want to, if they want to pick a theological topic to go deep on. It's not a long book, but there's a lot of meat in this book. And if you know anything about uh, atonement studies, there's a lot behind what yeah. you've written in there, but you do a good job. It's why it fits so well in the short studies series in there as well. So, so if you're looking for a good summary out there of 
of atonement. And atonement's just been, I don't know how it couldn't be one of my favorite doctrines, but it's a, it's just a delight to be able to read and you do, and you handle it well. So um, I want to end where you end in the book and, and read this quote from your book, uh, The Atonement. Um, quote, while Christ makes us whole again, the greatest accomplishment of the cross is that we are made at one with God. And this is the key. If all the ills of the world were healed, all the injustices made right, and all the sadness undone, but we were still not right with God, then it would only be a momentary relief in our suffering and in our eternal longing for God. There are many problems in the world, but the atonement deals with the problem beneath every problem. Through Christ's death on the cross, we are reconciled to God. Amen. Thanks, Jeremy. Thank you, Colin.